Hey guys, welcome back to MarkDillon.XXX, which is soon to be MarkDillon.com. Uh, one of the new features on the site is going to be interviews, like this one I'm about to do. Uh, they won't always be related to the adult industry, uh, but they'll be topics that I feel are interesting and uh, possibly of utility to the gay community as a whole. So today's guest is my friend Joe, who's not only a very talented lawyer, but uh, in my opinion, just a really great person. Joe, welcome. Good evening, Mark. Thank you very much. I appreciate the uh, the invitation. I truly do. Well, I've had uh, I've had several very interesting discussions with you about many many topics, and you are certainly knowledgeable in many areas, not just this one. But I think you are a great person to ask some of these questions about gay marriage and civil unions and. Uh, and you, you just have so much information, and I think a lot of it might be useful to some of our list, some of my listeners. So, would you mind answering a few questions? No, not at all. I, I appreciate the opportunity, and, and again, thank you. Um, uh, again, thank you for the praise. I, I truly do. Uh, I truly do appreciate it. So please fire away. I'll help as much right. as I can. Well, and, and just a, a, a little quick background. You, um, y your area of practice in the legal world is around like family law and and all of that absolutely uh, I practice uh, actually uh, in the state of New Jersey New York and Pennsylvania uh, right now hoping to expand further as my firm grows but uh, my area of specific uh, my area special speciality as they say is uh, is family law and dealing with uh, primarily domestic abuse issues um, as well as child custody issues. Ah, fantastic. Those will actually be things that, uh, that will be related to questions I have for you. You ready? I sure am. All right, Joe. So first of all, what is the legal difference between a civil union and a gay marriage? And also, is there any benefit to choosing one over the other? Let's be very clear that a civil union is a legal fiction created by a handful of states in a compromise between those who did not want same-sex couples uh, to, uh, to – or did not want to recognize the relationship between uh, same-sex couples as a marriage uh, for either moral or theological reasons. And so okay. the compromise that was created was a civil union. The problem is, is that that particular institution only had the benefits of marriage as long as it was confined to that state. The moment you moved out of a state that permitted a civil union, for instance, like New Jersey did before gay marriage became law in the state of New Jersey, it unfortunately lost any authority uh, or it lost any benefit that you could have. So if you were in New Jersey and you moved, let's say, to the state of Utah, not sure why you would, but in the event that you did, <laughs> <laughs> you would automatically lose the protections that came with being in a civil union. Therefore, the only institution that truly benefits or truly confers all of those rights would be a marriage. And I can go through some of the other benefits as well very, very quickly. Um, sure. Marriage, Please do. Obviously, uh, you know, one of the other challenges is not only that uh, your relationship would not be recognized by other states, unfortunately, your relationship would not be recognized by the federal government as well. So you would miss out on certain tax benefits of which there were over 1,000 different tax breaks and benefits that you could enjoy as a married couple that you could not under a civil union. You're There's, kidding me. 1,000 oh, one, one uh, tax breaks? Absolutely. The – uh, what, what, the, what several organizations, not the least of which included the Human Rights Campaign uh, and, and others, eventually found out, and this is something that – this was a bit of research that I did on my own uh, in working with a colleague who is a tax accountant and handles a lot of my couples uh, – uh, handles a lot of my clients' tax I issues – was that there were close to 1,500 different tax benefits and breaks. That, married that is just enjoy. incredible. Yeah, that married couples okay. enjoy that you wouldn't enjoy without a civil union. Uh, I mean, without okay, a so traditional marriage. So, 
well. So you've you've explained to us uh, the difference between this the this concept of a civil union and gay marriage. But let's say you've got a a couple who has actually gone through with getting married in a state that that recognizes it. What are some of the uh, the common challenges you see these newly married couples facing? Well, the uh, such so let's let's say for example they're married in a uh, in, in one state and then they decide to move somewhere else that doesn't recognize it. So oh, um, the primary challenge is once again recognition. In fact, that's almost the exclusive challenge is in recognition. If you are married, let's say, in the state of New York that uh, permits same-sex marriage, but then you decide to move to the state of Texas, Texas does not at present recognize same-sex marriages. And therefore, your relationship in the eyes of the Texas state government is non-existent. In other words, simply by getting on an airplane, simply by driving your, your vehicle from New York to Texas, your relationship has absolutely no value in the eyes of the Texas state legislature, in the eyes of the Texas state government. There has been a change to that federally. What we've seen now is that Eric Holder, the attorney general uh, under President Obama, has maintained that now if you legally contract a marriage in any one of the states that presently permit it, the federal government will recognize that marriage for the purposes of tax benefits and other benefits. R regardless of where your current residence regardless is. Regardless of your current residence. The problem is okay. the state of Texas may not. Now, for a number of people, they might say, well, we, we will just avoid the state of Texas, if you will. The problem is what if your job sends you to Texas? What if you have parents in Texas and they are now older and you have been appointed as the individual to care for them and or their estate? In other words, what if, what if there are reasons for you needing to be in the state of Texas? That I'm so you, you, you wouldn't buy the argument from Texans who would say, well, uh, if, if there's a gay married couple that, that is not happy with our laws and our recognition of, of uh, same-sex marriage, they just shouldn't move here. Well, what you're saying is that there are extenuating circumstances that may require a person to move there. Therefore, uh, that, that should be it, – it's not just a voluntary choice because absolutely. I don't think many of us would choose to go and move to Texas. But absolutely. absolutely. Uh, the, the, we, should have the, we should have the same protections that we would have in New York in absolutely. terms of the validity of our marriage and all of that. Absolutely. You would, you would hope for comedy. The, the, response to, the response to those particular Texans are to, is to remind them, number one, of the great hospitality that their state is capable of offering, and then number two, to, uh, then number two to simply state that the law has – I mean, and this is something, and I, and I hate to get into the weeds of constitutional law, and I'm not going to do that here, but just to simply say that the Supreme Court has, all, has also recognized – that one of the fundamental rights that we as American citizens enjoy is the right to travel, and the uh, and that's and, and people need to remember that that's a fundamental right. Well, and, you have the right. And to also, uh, um, excuse me for interrupting, sure. but one of the the things that protects all of us is the fact that the, the reciprocity between different states. That uh, if we engage in a, in, a, in a deal in one state, a business deal, or we, we, we are uh, – whether it be personal or business, other states generally recognize that. For example, if I have my driver's license in Mississippi and I take a drive around L.A. and I, and I get pulled over and I show them that I'm licensed to drive in Mississippi, that's usually recognized as – giving me the right to drive on any street that I'm on, correct? Absolutely, it does. Unfortunately, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you, how you look at it, there has always been a tension between the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution, which guarantees states' rights, and this whole concept of federalism, this, this whole idea that states are individually sovereign in free association with one another. And as a result of that, an entire body of law known as conflict of laws has emerged. And, and if any of your listeners okay. decide to go to law school, please let them know it's an area which, in which you can make a, an obscene amount of money uh, dealing with. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's called conflict of laws. What happens when you have Mississippi, for instance, saying we do not accept uh, gay adoptions or we do, not pre uh, we do not permit gay adoptions? And right next door, for instance, you may have Florida that says we do. 
when how does this how does the united states federal government resolve these or federal courts rather resolve these conflicts between the states when their laws are butting heads and that's going to be the interesting area uh, the interesting area of debate when this issue eventually arrives at the doorstep of the Supreme Court, and, and I just think uh, – Well, I, I, I personally can think of several areas of conflict that I'd actually like to get your opinion on. Sure. So let's, let's assume uh, I get married to someone in New York, mm -hmm. and we, did, we get crazy and we decide to move to Texas. Yes. Uh, it, let's say we had children. Sure. Uh, and in the event of a separation or a divorce or or anything like that, how how would being married in New York, where it is recognized, and then relocating to a state like Texas affect things like uh, adopting or raising children? Uh, if you get divorced, how do you split assets? Uh, if someone dies, uh, one of the partners dies, how is the estate handled? If you're in – if you were legally married in one state, but you're now living in a state that doesn't recognize the marriage, how do you deal with those things? The the, let me first start off by saying that everything that I'm about to say after this, uh, this caveat is, uh, predicated on, is predicated on the idea that the state that does not recognize your same-sex union will at least recognize agreements between the parties. So – if you are a couple that is con that contracts a marriage in New York, moves to the state of Texas, and unfortunately the relationship falls apart as they as they do as they are wont to do, one of the best things that you can actually do is to is to actually enter into, and I hate to say it like this because I know a number of people are going to say this is a horrible idea, or, or it's a horrible substitute rather, is to form what are known as roommate agreements. Uh, roommate agreements will have the effect of a prenuptial agreement in the event that we no longer live together. These are how the assets that we've acquired will be divided. The, this is how we will divide up the, the liquid assets in our relation, you know, in, uh, that have been formed since our relationship. With regard to the children, I always encourage individuals who are in, uh, and, and I say non-traditional in quotes, relationships because you also see the rise of uh, polyamorous relationships, multiple partners. In those right. circumstances, I always encourage the individuals involved to form co-parenting or custody arrangements before they either adopt or have children. Why? Because in all 50 states, the presumption of parentage goes to the biological parent. So for instance, if you and your husband uh, were to get married in New York, but it is your sperm that is used, for instance, in an in vitro procedure, mm -hmm. and it is, and the child is born of that. You, in, in the in the eyes of certain jurisdictions in Texas, not all of them, and this is what makes it even more complicated. You could even get to a state that where you have certain cities like Dallas who would recognize your adoption go over to Fort Worth, and they do not. So. You so what you so there is a presumption that that child is actually Mark's. That is his child. So then you would have to you would the other partner or your your husband would have to would have to participate in what's known as a step parent adoption, which that's mm -hmm. ludicrous in and of itself. But a step parent adoption where the where he would where he would apply to be the step parent of a child that was intended to be his. And once you do that, make sure that you have filed a co-parenting agreement and a custody agreement so that in the event of this breakup, you can at least say to the court, we share this child as parents. This is the agreement right. we've come up with. The unfortunate thing is, Mark, in a, in a number of instances, particularly throughout the South and the Midwest, courts have even become incredulous uh, in accepting those contracts. But the point is, at least it is there in place. So those are the things that I would – and then, of course, um, very, very quickly, with regard to a spouse who may become ill or how you, you deal with that, one of the things that I encourage all couples to do, heterosexual, 
um, or gay couples is I always encourage them to have a living, durable will with a health care proxy or medical directive. That's a big way of saying make sure that you have, that you have created a document that, that spells out exactly what is to happen to you in the event of incapacity and make sure that you name your spouse or loved mm-hmm. one as the proxy, the person who will make the decisions. Because if you go into that hospital in Jackson, Mississippi, that hospital has no obligation to respect the wishes of your husband in making decisions for your health care. They are, they are liable to call a parent, a sibling, before them. And that's an unfortunate circumstance. But if you have a health care proxy that's been one of the documents that has been recognized in all 50 states, regardless of the relationship of the parties, make sure you have that. And last but certainly not least, I hound all of my clients for this, make sure you just have a regular will that lays out all of your estate, who is to receive what, and under what terms. That way, should these instances occur, you, are, you can leave this earth knowing that your loved ones have been taken care of and that the estate is, is well. That said, believe me, I participated in a number of challenges to wills on the grounds that, oh, well, this marriage isn't legitimate, therefore we're going to attack it. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Do any of these um, alternative ways of kind of protecting your assets or your children or your estate, do they – they don't supersede whatever the, the – um, I guess the traditional way of, of uh, doing these things is? For example, um, if, if you wanted to leave your estate to your partner, even in the event that you had uh, – uh, a will. Would it be possible for other family members to come in and contest that because uh, th- they would be contesting the validity of the marriage in the state that you live in? Absolutely. Does that have any effect on it? it, it one thing it, it depends on where the depends on where the decedent uh, was a resident. What I have found is is that more and more there has been an acceptance of a last will and testament as being a last will and testament, provided that it's in proper form. And I always encourage people to sit down with an attorney if you have a substantial estate to make sure that everything is done properly, or if you believe you have those kind of family members who were challenged. Uh, very, very quickly to give you an example of what I mean, even in the state of, even in the state of New Jersey, which is fairly liberal, progressive on, uh, on these issues, had a situation, not me, but a close colleague who was dealing with a young woman who had been raised in a traditionally Muslim home who was herself a uh, lesbian and had a partner. She had a last will and testament that the mother and father challenged when uh, their daughter passed away from a sudden brain aneurysm. They challenged the will and tied it up in New Jersey courts for about a good four and a half years, back and forth, trying to argue that the marriage was not valid, that the, that the partner had duped her, that she had been seduced, this, that, and the third. And the state of New Jersey, fairly progressive, who would have ordinarily looked at the will and said, this will is in proper form, we see no issue of undue influence. Unfortunately, this particular case kept going around and around the circle. So even when you have it in a fairly, in a fairly liberal state, Last will and testaments can be challenged, but that's true for heterosexuals as well. I'm just saying that it's even more so for same-sex couples. So it be it becomes a bigger issue if that's uh, if you're if you're a same-sex couple, uh, especially if you're not because generally in most states when one spouse passes, mm-hmm. uh, the, the estate immediately flows. Uh, to the surviving spouse, it, it, provided that they 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 had the name the you know both names on the bank account, both names on the deed to the house. Mm-hmm. There's really no legal legwork that needs to be done generally. Right. If the if one I mean that's one of the benefits of a traditional marriage is that if one spouse dies, what they call intestate, meaning uh, that they die without a will. It, there are rules of intestacy that uh, that kick in, and the spouse is named. Uh, the spouse is named as the chief beneficiary, typically exactly. the executor, exec, executrix. It gets a little bit more complicated once you have children involved, but the spouse is normally named. 
in a situation where the marriage is not recognized, we're living in Texas, those rules of intestacy are not automatic for those same-sex couples. And therefore, it is even more of an imperative to be, uh, to be armed to the teeth with these types of legal documents, co-parenting agreement, custody agreement, roommate agreement, uh, the living durable will with the health care proxy, and last but certainly not least, a will, a general okay. will. So that th th those items are a good way to at least give yourself, uh, if you're a same-sex couple, some of the protections that come along with a traditional heterosexual marriage. Absolutely, absolutely. But all th all that being said, that that a lot of that is, uh, if if you're a young same-sex couple who's thinking about getting married, uh, some of those things. Yeah, not everybody can afford to go and. And sit down with a with an estate planner or an estate attorney, or have a have a lawyer draft all these different documents. Are there resources available for couples facing any of these challenges to help them kind of navigate this uncharted territory? There are, there are. Depending on where you live, obviously it's going to be more sparse uh, in in certain areas. I always encourage uh, people who live in the quote unquote flyover states and in the south to find those free resources somewhere in the bigger cities. If you're in Louisiana, you can go to Baton Rouge and New Orleans. If you're in Mississippi, you know, believe it or not, Jackson does have some of these resources. One of the best places to go is to go to Lambda Defense Fund or Lambda Legal, uh, which is one of the more vanguard legal groups uh, fighting these particular issues. And on their website, you will see links to uh, you will see links to resources where you can go and uh, and actually purchase these materials free of charge, or they will direct you to libraries that contain them. Uh, you can always hit up your local human rights campaign, um, uh, your local human rights campaign shop to do so. And one of the other greater resources is to find your local law library. Every state that I know of that has a library typically has an addition for a uh, – a, typically their library is federally funded, which means that it's a federal depository, meaning that they must accept anyone in the, from the public, just like your local public library. Go in, okay. and you'll be able to find those resources. You'll see ready-made wills that you can easily manipulate and fill in that information. And then if you truly are strapped for cash and you say, look, I, I want to make sure that these things are done right, uh, one of the best resources is, is to actually, uh, believe it or not, is to actually visit with legal aid. I know a number of people that go, that's a headache and a half to do, but a number of your legal aid services, particularly in places like San Diego, San Francisco, um, in Dallas, uh, has a very vibrant one are willing to help you to draft these documents because they understand the importance of them. Do not leave a state that affirms your marriage without those documents in place. It is, it is one of the things that I encourage. Oh, that, that, that's a really fantastic point, one which I didn't even think about. That right. you, you really need to have uh, – when you're, when you're preparing to move, before you leave the state that recognizes your marriage, you need to have all these documents uh, drafted and signed and notarized before you move to the, the new state. Absolutely. Abs that is a fantastic Absolutely. point. Absolutely. And, don't, don't move without it. Yeah. And uh, – I guess this this question is a little bit a uh, little more personal, but I, I think you have such great perspective on these things, and you're without a doubt one of the most open-minded people I've had the, the pleasure of talking with. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, the the lunch we had was just so interesting and so informative for me. But um, in in your opinion, have you ever heard an argument? from the people who were opposed to gay marriage that you thought had any validity or made any sort of sense? I, I guess I'm asking you to play devil's advocate sure, just sure, a little bit. Sure. I, uh, I have not heard any uh, – I've not heard any practical arguments that I found to be persuasive. didn't find any practical arguments. The, in fact, what I, very, what I find very interesting are the three people uh, in the past I – I would say in the past – Six months who've made some very interesting statements on that on that very point. Bill O'Reilly from Fox News, 
Justice Antonin Scalia, arguably the most conservative member of the Supreme Court, and Pat Robertson. All three of these men in the past six months have made the statement that the arguments concerning the practical arguments being made against same-sex marriage will not hold. Justice Scalia went so far as to say that, in fact, he only believed that there were moral or theological arguments that could be made that he found persuasive. I think the only one uh, that I have that I believed had a ring of had a ring of efficacy to me is the argument, uh, and, and bear in mind, I cannot abide slippery slope arguments. I, I don't like them. I think that they're unfair, and they're not a reason not to act oh. because they're there. Oh, oh boy, Joe, don't tell me you're, the, the, the old argument that if we allow gay marriage, what's next? Do we allow people – it's a slippery slope. Do we I, allow them to marry their dog or their <laughs> cat or their cow? Don't tell me you're giving that one any validity, no, it, Joe. It, it, Please. It, it, yeah, look, this is this – is that particular argument is, is only – it has to be framed this way. I tell people all the time the bestiality argument doesn't work because bestiality is rape, and there's no way that the – you know because an animal can never give consent. So I'm not even concerned about tomorrow Farmer Joe being able to marry you know, his pig. Right. What I am concerned about is not necessarily what it will lead to but the arguments that could be made. If the argument is based on the idea that adults should be able to do whatever it is that adults do, then it doesn't take into account some of the more hmm, – how shall I say it? It doesn't take into account some of the more hmm, – some of the some of the consequences that could come from that kind of libertine perspective on relations. I, I, I see what I see what you're saying, but I don't think anyone is advocating for um, kind of a new standard mm-hmm. by you know towards what we feel is acceptable in terms of. I, I think it's more about equality within the standards that we have set as a society. Right. I don't think. Um, uh, anybody saying that it should be okay for two adults to go out and do whatever it is that they want, it, regardless of whether it's harmful to themselves or harmful to other people. I think it's particularly disheartening when we say uh, marriage is this wonderful, fantastic institution that's accepted almost universally around the world, but we're going to prohibit uh, same-sex couples from engaging in that Wonderful institution, right? No, I I understand the I understand that, but but I see where you were going, right? It, um, it's really a matter of look. Let me be very let me be very candid with you. My belief is is that all of these side arguments about what constitutes tradition, so forth and so on, clouds our focus. It, it distracts from what is in the Constitution. And the question is, if you cannot give a legal reason, I understand your theological, I understand your moral reasons. If you cannot give a solid legal reason, then that ends the debate for me because – I could not agree with you more. Yeah, we are a nation of laws, and we have said that the Constitution will be the guiding document for these issues in our society. I, that does not mean to suggest that we ought to be a completely amoral society, like I said, given, you know, giving way to a, a completely libertine lifestyle, but it is to say – that in these issues where we cannot make the claim that you know that children of gay parents are, are going to grow up wayward, for instance, which is one of the arguments uh, often made that I bristle at, or that the chil- you know, or that these couples are going to be engaged in every you know in every form of immoral activity from drugs to sexually promiscuous behavior, something that isn't borne out by the statistics either. When I hear these, other- not only is it not borne by the statistics, but it. But when it does happen, it's not localized within the gay community right. either. Uh, you you find uh, you know terrible uh, uh, instances of child abuse within heterosexual couples, physical abuse, sexual abuse, mental abuse. Uh, you find couples who straight couples who are swingers or, or or drug abusers. So this idea that somehow those issues are localized to uh, gay men and women is just such a falsehood that's been. Uh, that has permeated so many people uh, within the straight community. Absolutely, and it's and, and it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that those arguments are even still being levied in in the in the face of what we know to be true. That was the reason why hearing you know probably of the three hearing Pat Robertson make the claim that there was no practical 
there was no practical prohibition. His was purely moral and theological. And then hearing O'Reilly and Scalia make the same comment, I thought that, that, that it finally represents the turning point on this issue where we finally said, look, the question is, does the 14th Amendment permit this kind of discrimination? And, and for the benefit of your listeners, let's be very clear that the 14th Amendment does permit certain forms of discrimination. The question is, is does it permit it in this instance? And I think well, honestly it does g- not. Joe, give me an example of where the 14th Amendment does allow di- for discrimination. Sure. One of the uh, – sure. Um, the 14th Amendment may very well say – perfect example. You have 18-year-olds who say, I want to drink. I want to drink, and the law says at the age of 21 you may do so. The Supreme Court has determined that equal protection doesn't necessarily apply to all issues of ageism because there are certain instances where you are too young, and there are certain instances where you are too old. Let's consider – But would you, know, would you say that this would be more akin, though, to saying we'll, we'll allow uh, – 18-year-old men to drink, but not 18-year-old women to drink. Actually, that's very interesting that you use that example. It's very interesting because that was actually a Supreme Court case uh, in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, I think it was Mm -hmm. Oklahoma State University or Oklahoma University, either one, with President Boren had a different drinking age uh, for their students than others. And ultimately, the Supreme Court said you couldn't discriminate. But in that instance, it was a matter of gender. And again, not to get too thick into the constitutional weeds, but when it comes to equal protection, the Supreme Court evaluates issues of discrimination on three different tiers, of which age and unfortunately sexuality has been on the lowest tier. In other words, the government has the lowest burden necessary. But over the years, what you've seen through consistent uh, or through constant uh, Supreme Court cases dealing with the issue of sexuality, the court has not accepted that sexuality is in that second, and they certainly haven't accepted that it's on that first tier with race, for instance, or that second tier with gender. But what they've said is, is that we're no longer going to say that sexuality is just like age or it's just like, uh, it's just like your, um, your, finan- you know, your financial status. We're going to say that it has a lot more bite than that, and in fact, that's what you hear the court use it. Okay. The bite. So, so. I, well, I, that actually brings up a very interesting uh, topic of discussion for me. Is I think it's very, you know, when you say that there's different tiers by which the government will judge how important these things are, I think that applies to society as well. Mm-hmm. And and one of the things that I find so interesting is. There, there's very often a uh, – I think people dismiss just how important it is to, to give the gay community equal rights and protections. And when someone says that this is the civil rights struggle of our generation, mm-hmm. which I've even heard uh, – you know, uh, I've heard Michael Bloomberg say it. I've heard so many – but people really criticize that as if somehow gay rights are not as important as – rights uh, for women or rights for minorities or rights for uh, against age discrimination. Mm -hmm. Uh, Why do you think it is that that so many people don't want to liken the gay rights struggle and our desire to have the same rights and benefits to other civil rights struggles of the past? Well, I believe that the reason I believe the reason why and I've had this discussion, uh, you know, many a time. The reason is, is that you is that when you take a look at the struggle for, for instance, racial equality in this country, you're talking about a group of individuals of which, you know, of, of which my grandmother uh, was a part of that struggle, my mother was a part of that struggle, actively participating in it. What you had was a complete disenfranchisement legally of all rights. Right. Okay. No voting, no so forth and so on. With women, you had even a degree of that in not being able to vote, so forth and so on. When you take a look at the modern civil rights movements, and it isn't just with same-sex couples. We're talking about that with uh, the handicap as well in this country. Disability rights have really come to the forefront over the years. What the, 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 the challenge that many people have had in conflating the two is one of degree is that when you take a look at these particular struggles from the past, 
conflating them with modern struggles to be married at a time, you know, when you look back and realize that there was a time where African Americans, regardless of who you loved, regardless of anything else, you weren't even a human being to even be considered marriage. It seems offensive from a historical vantage point. And the other thing is, is that when you take a look at the number of constitutional provisions that were expressly clear about the way American citizens were to be treated, and then you take a look at the history of African Americans and their treatment here in the United States, it is, a, it is one of the more flagrant or more obvious instances of government of, – uh, let, me, let me say this the way I wanted to. It's one of the more obvious instances of a government's complete disregard for the laws it adopted that you've ever seen. It does not mean, however, and this is what I continue to tell a number of my African-American colleagues who argue this point vociferously, it does not mean, however, that there are not several points of tangency that connect those movements to this one today. The Equal right. Protection Clause is every bit is every bit as important in this struggle I, as it was then. And those right. points of tangency are what we should focus on, not those points of distinction. I guess that was the point I was trying to get at, Joe, is that it seems like many people um, – it, it really mitigates the importance of kind of the, the gay rights struggle of today in terms of equality by saying, well, it's just not that important because mm. the discrimination is not as egregious as what happened to African Americans or to women or to – this group or that group, and I agree with you that, um, like you said, in terms of what happened to the African American community, it was one of the worst examples of uh, a mistreatment of uh, of any group of people that you can find in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really terrible. Mm -hmm. And but I think to say that somehow, uh, when people make the argument uh, that you can't compare. The, the, the struggle for uh, gay people to be equal uh, in the eyes of society, anybody who's being discriminated against, mm -hmm. that, that group deserves just as much support from society as any other group before. Absolutely, and, and it's and, uh, and, and not just because one 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 group or one gender or one issue before had it worse. Right, it's that nobody should be. Denied their 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 basic civil liberties and basic human rights. Absolutely, you you heard our president say this particular quote before, and I heard it quite a bit growing up. Do not let do not let perfection be the enemy of good. In other words, exactly, we cannot have a strict comparison, a strict one for one comparison between the struggles. Does it mean that this one is of no value? It's of no importance. It's of no good. It's important to focus on, like you said, the points of tangency, and as I said, to focus on the law itself. Absolutely. I agree with you totally. And I guess, Joe, my last question for you, mm -hmm. uh, and first of all, uh, let me just say I would really like to thank you for coming on because this has not only been something that has been incredibly enjoyable for me. As you know, we, we can talk about this kind of stuff until the pigs come home, Absolutely. but I think there will be a lot of utility to the, the listeners of this mm -hmm. because it, it, um, it's a topic that I think um, a lot of people don't really know how to go about acquiring the resources to figure, figure this stuff out. And you've been so helpful providing you know, the tips on what to do to protect your, your assets or how to raise children. But my last question to you is… When do you think gay marriage will be accepted in all 50 states? Hmm. Hmm. That's a good one. Um, <laughs> if, if, the current trend of, if the current trend of federal judicial intervention continues, uh, I would say at the pace that it's moving now, I, I believe you'll, you more than likely will see, see a decision either in favor or against uh, by the Supreme Court within the next, I would say, within the next two years. It'll be a settled in, in settled issue. If, so you think it's likely to be settled federally versus on a state-by-state -state basis over I, time? I do. I do, which, which carries with it its own risks. 
if I if I could camp here for just a second, just a quick second, Justice sure. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, was writing in her memoir about her life as an attorney prior to joining the Supreme Court, and one of the, and and you know and, and one of the jobs that Justice Ginsburg held was. Uh, I believe she was president of the National Organization of Women. It might have been another organization, but whatever. The point was is that she had been on the for, on the for, on the front lines fighting for women's reproductive health rights for years before Roe v. Wade, you know, was handed down. One of the things that Justice Ginsburg said surprisingly, as I was reading through that memoir, was how she lamented the fact that the culture wars around women's reproductive health rights were still raging today, and she believed that the number one cause for that was the feeling amongst pro-lifers that the federal government had stepped in and had unfortunately taken away from them their, their democratic voice, that that is what had happened. She believed that the statistics and the evidence showed that there was a slow progression – slow – but it, a progression it, nonetheless towards social acceptance. And her concern is, you know, and, and, and my concern is in taking from that and looking at this is, are we going to be fighting the culture wars on this 20 years after the decision it, is made? It's, it's so interesting you, you said that, Joe, because that echoes my, my concern exactly. Uh, because you, can, you can't legislate acceptance. Absolutely. Acceptance and tolerance take time. And, and I think that... Uh, over time, even in the most conservative districts, uh, people are becoming more and more tolerant. And I think when you have something handed down at the, from the federal level, uh, it, it, it tends to put people into almost uh, – they go back into defensive mode. Absolutely. A, a, and whereas they were starting to come around and they were starting to – you know, maybe become a little bit more accepting. Then all of a sudden, the walls go right back up. Absolutely. Um, and I think that could actually that could cause future trouble because I personally think that it's likely within several years that the federal government will decide that uh, from from one coast to the other and everywhere in between. All married couples should be entitled to the same rights. Absolutely, and I, and I can tell you what to you know I can tell you that right now Kentucky's challenge to a latest federal court uh, decision, as well as Utah, is what might be or what might provide the tipping point. You know, in both of those states, uh, the federal court judge requiring Kentucky to acknowledge a same-sex marriage contracted outside of Kentucky. And in Utah, striking down Utah's same-sex marriage ban altogether, both of those orders have been stayed pending the outcome of appeals uh, to the circuit courts above. But the point is simply that in both of those situations, you're dealing with highly conservative red states. And my belief is, is that depending on what those circuit courts of appeals state, you may see this fast-tracked to the Supreme Court where they will no longer be able to dodge the issue. They're going to have to answer it head-on, and ironically enough, it is the conservatives to the court that are chomping at the bit to handle this case. It's actually your liberal wing who is not, and I think most of that is because – the liberal wing is concerned about the quote-unquote slippery slope argument um, that how compelling would that be to a Justice Kennedy, the alleged swing vote on the Supreme Court? How much would he say, look, I'm not saying that gay couples wouldn't do this, but how do we handle, let's say, incestuous relationships in the future? Should they be permitted? Can we allow that? Knowing what we know, and that's the reason but, why. I think. But I, I, I think when you talk about incestuous relationships, mm -hmm. there is a very tangible um, negative effect that can come about because of those. Uh, you know, for example, if you have children with close re rel uh, between uh, close relatives, they're more likely to suffer certain genetic conditions or um, things like that. Sure. Uh, so th there's a, there's a tangible. Right, a negative effect from right. that relationship. The, the biggest uh, one, of, uh, yeah, the biggest one of all for me has always been the, you know, the Freudian argument that says that incest actually breeds antisocial behavior, and therefore it should not be allowed. The unfortunate thing is, is that much of Freud's work has been undermined by successive psychologists who maintain that that's not necessarily true. And what if you have a sterile couple, or what if you have a sterile mother? 
son couple or you have a father-son couple. I'm not maintaining, again, as I said before, and, I, and I'm glad we got back to this, I'm not maintaining that the slippery slope argument is legally compelling. I'm right. maintaining it is the only one with which that deals with the that deals with the tip of the morality issue that to me I have found even the slightest bit you know worthy of response everything else I've just been you know it's the one that that occasionally will make you scratch your head and say is there something to this right exactly Uh, whether uh, I find it compelling uh, legally is another issue right I I would agree with you on that and it's certainly a fascinating topic to discuss and I just really want to thank you so much for no coming on and, and sharing your expertise with us. No problem. Thank you very much. I appreciate it greatly. All right. Well, Joe, I look forward to talking with you in the future, and maybe you can give us some advice on some other topics down absolutely, the road. Absolutely. absolutely. If, you, if you would, uh, you know, I certainly can't tell you how to run your website, but Mark, if you have an occasion where you want to discuss issues of domestic violence and sexual assault in the in the community, I would be most honored to come back. Those are the two issues that are closest to my heart in terms of advocacy, and there is quite a bit that the community uh, doesn't. Well, and let me let me lavish you with some praise also. I, I think it's so admirable that you you do quite a bit of charitable and pro bono work in that area. So. I think that is a real testament to what a what a great person you are. So thank you. I appreciate it. I do. And and the same to you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. I don't get this very often uh, because most of my clients what I'm saying now goes over their head and with my students it's definitely the case. So um I, I thank you for this opportunity. I, I truly appreciate it and uh, look forward to meeting with you too. Um, unfortunately, we have not been able to get together while you were you were on this round in New York, but hopefully you'll be. Well, I I, I have been quite busy. I've got yeah. some very new and interesting projects in the works. Some some that are not adult related, mm. but um, I I think certainly the next time I'm back in the city, or possibly before I leave this trip, if 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 we're both free, I think we most certainly have to do lunch. We definitely do. We definitely do. I'm looking forward to it. Um, All right, Joe. I'll talk to you later. Have a good evening. Thank you for joining us. Have a great one, and thank you again. Thanks.